Chapter 12. Abnormal Psychology It had been a refreshing spring day in Southern California, a day when all the flowers had bloomed, a day when people were restless to get outdoors after work. Brad bicycled home from McDonald's at 1 a.m., exhausted after a busy shift. He found a police car and an ambulance with lights flashing parked outside their house. He didn't stop. What the hell was going on? His father was supposed to get out of jail any day. Maybe he was out. But he wouldn't get to trouble that quick. Brad rode down the street a few blocks, circled back, and rolled by again, staying on the other side of the street. The paramedics wheeled a gurney out through the front door with a body on it, covered from head to toe in white. A cop was with them. He rode by again, only to speed by and swing around the block. Whatever bad news was going on, he wasn't going to become a part of it. Who could that be? He had no clue. His habit was to come home late every night, crash, and leave early in the morning. He'd structured his life around avoiding the toxic adults in that house, with their booze, smoke, and noise. He didn't know most of the people his parents partied with, and preferred it that way. When Brad circled back the third time, the ambulance had driven off, and the police cruiser was backing out of the driveway. He waited before finally going to the door. He looked inside to see his mom washing blood off the floor. She was stone-faced and didn't look up when he came in. He looked around. Jeffrey, Glenn, and his younger brother Rob were all in bed, either asleep or pretending to be. Samuel was wired up and red-faced, making Brad wonder if somebody had given him an upper. He told the story. Dad got out of jail and came over, and Mom was with her new boyfriend. She was surprised to see him, but he acted all friendly, and they were laughing and drinking together. They got pretty drunk. And Dad told me to get Slugger out from under their bed. I got it for him. And he showed it to Mom's boyfriend and described how he liked to go to the park on the weekend and hit balls. He pretended to show him how he took a swing. The dude was big, too. He told Dad, don't point that thing at me. I have to tell you I'm a black belt in karate and my hands are deadly weapons. Sam looked at their mother who had finished cleaning the floor and was now washing blood off the wall. She was crying softly. Mom, are you okay? I'm just fine, honey, she said in a monotone. Brad pieced the story together and slid into a kitchen chair. He looked around, counting blood splatter on three walls of the kitchen, and his mind reeled from imagining the trauma. Sam kept talking, his eyes bright, his hands shaking. He kept wiping them on his shirt. Dad pretended to be respectful and put the bat down. Then he said, are you really a karate expert? Show me a move. The guy said yes, and got up and threw a kick at Dad like he was showing off. Dad blocked it with his arm, but you could hear him get hit, and it must have hurt. Dad said, I just want to make sure you got the first one in, partner. Then he went over and got Slugger. Nobody thought anything bad would happen. We thought he was just playing around. Then he took a hard swing and hit the guy right in the head, and he kept hitting until blood was flying and the guy fell down. Dad kept hitting him until his brains were coming out of his head. Mom was screaming. Sam started crying and heaving sobs. Then Dad washed his hands. He took off with the bat and drove away. Sam was choking back tears, trying to control his anguish. Brad hugged his little brother, who was shaking hard. Mom called the police and the ambulance. The cops came and took pictures, and then they took the man's body out. Mom told them a crazy guy came in with a bat and beat her friend and tried to rape her. She was upset and the police had to calm her down. Oh, Sam. Is everyone okay? No one in the family is hurt. Brad felt like he was outside of his body and watching himself in the corner of the room. He was powerless to say or do anything that made sense. Nah, we're good. Sam stopped shaking. Telling his older brother what happened made him feel better as if the trauma had just been handed off. Their mother had apparently given up on cleaning. She sat on the couch smoking. How is McDonald's? Okay, I brought some leftover hamburgers and french fries. Brad pulled the food out of his backpack. He wasn't hungry or tired. He was numb. Sam woke up his brothers, and they all gathered around to eat the stale burgers and fries. It was amazing how everyone was acting normally. 
but nothing was normal except that they were growing boys who were hungry and never turned down an offer to eat. There had never been normal. The Rosedale family shook off the murder of Natalie's boyfriend like they had shaken off other family traumas. They internalized it and pretended it didn't happen. A few weeks later, Natalie got a call from Morris, who was in Texas. Baby, I got us a nice place here. We can have a whole new life. My uncle Bob has some land here outside of Houston, and he offered to put a nice big trailer on it and give us a place to stay if I do some work for him. He wants to help our kids out. Mo was afraid if the authorities started questioning him. One thing would lead to another, and he would get arrested for manslaughter, if not outright murder. There also may have been a shred of guilty conscience that made him want to run away from his bad deeds in California and start over. Natalie hadn't slept well since the killing. She was caught in a kaleidoscope of emotions. She missed Mo and would have gotten rid of her karate expert boyfriend if she knew her husband was getting released from jail that day. She was also brimming with revulsion at the brutal beating. Nat, are you there, baby? Nat? Mo's voice boomed through the phone. Come and get us, she said. I'm going to have to get you all to take a bus to Phoenix. I can't enter California. I'm afraid my name will come up. He wired her money for bus tickets, and she waited for her next welfare check. Then she gave the boys a two-day notice that they were leaving. What the hell? Brad said in Natalie. I have a full-time job. I'm making straight A's, and Dad's on the run for murder. Why don't we settle down for once and get our shit together? What are you talking about? He's your father. He has a better life for us. She told him about the promises Mo had made, and it seemed that she believed them. A better life? Some cow pasture in Texas? I'm better off living in Grandma's basement. You can go without me. The protest went nowhere. He had just turned 16, was in no position to stay by himself, and Grandma Mary was no guardian angel. There was barely time to get a transfer note from school and close the savings account, which had almost $500. What in the hell goes on in people's heads to cause all this craziness? Brad chewed on the problem. In school, he had learned about counselors who made a living fixing people's mental problems. He could be a counselor. It would help people. Maybe he could even fix his family. Okay, I'll go to Texas, he told his mother. I'm so glad to hear that, honey. Can I borrow some money? Days later, the bus arrived in Phoenix at 11 p.m. The station was deserted except for a couple of uniformed workers. Mo came sauntering out wearing a cowboy hat and boots, crisp jeans, and a flannel shirt, just like out of a Western. Natalie ran down the steps of the bus and almost leaped into his arms. Bradley and Jeffrey were ordered to transfer the luggage, which was mostly in garbage bags and cardboard boxes, into the back of an old green pickup truck that had Texas license plates. Mo strapped a tarp over it, and the seven of them stuffed themselves into the cab and headed east down Interstate 10. Morris drove like a man on a mission, or in this case, a fugitive running from the law, only stopping for gas or when someone desperately needed to pee. Why didn't we take the bus? complained Jeffrey. He was tired of holding the youngest one, Robbie, in his lap. Glenn and Samuel were squeezed in like they were an afterthought. The vehicle was so chock full of people that it was probably illegal but Morris kept a hawk eye out for the law and luck was with him. At the first stop, Brad had talked his way into getting under the tarp in the back, curled between boxes, cold air whipping around him. You guys are gonna love it in Texas, just wait, Natalie kept promising. She had no idea what they were getting into, but craved adventure in any form and was getting it now. They made it to Huntsville, Texas after dark the following evening. Morris pulled in to gas up and grab a case of beer. The doors opened and everybody piled out. Are we here now? Asked Brad, coming up from under the tarp. He looked out at the little town that back in L.A. would have been just a neighborhood with a couple of traffic lights. Surely there must be a real city nearby. Dad said we are only a few miles away from our new home, said Natalie, who headed for the ladies' restroom. My legs are numb, complained Jeffrey. We should have stayed in California. I want to see the cows, said Glenn. I'm hungry, too, he was crying. We are in the middle of nowhere, said Bradley, as though it were another planet. Mo came out with a case of beer and a bag of snacks. He put the beer under the tarp. Don't eat it all at once, boys, he said, handing out sugary treats and candies, which they wolfed down hungrily. It angered Brad that the empty calories were their dinner. 
He ignored his dad and went into the gas mart where he gathered bags of nuts and dried fruits and a few bottles of juice and paid for them with some bills he kept down in one of his socks. Then he came out and offered them to everyone. His little brothers looked back and forth between the food Brad held and their tall, mean-looking father and didn't take any of it. You got his breakfast for the morning. Good stuff, son. Everyone get your asses back in the truck and let's get to our new home. Natalie came out of the restroom and took a little package of cookies from Mo, and Brad climbed back under the tarp and ate some of his mixed nuts. The truck drove 10 minutes until it suddenly hit a rough patch. Brad bounced hard, bruising his tailbone and striking his head on a wheel well. He screamed in surprise and pain, but Mo didn't stop or slow down. The tossing and bumping went on until they reached the trailer, which was three miles off the highway down a dirt road. Brad hunkered down and rode it out. He could hear his younger brothers crying. Slow down. Damn it, Morris. What is wrong with you? Natalie protested. Somebody in the back of this truck needs a damn lesson, baby. They arrived at the trailer. Brad heard the engine turn off and caught the scent of cow manure. It was a real honest-to-God cow pasture. Any trouble back there with your nice food and juice, son? Mars said. His voice was smooth and warm. Brad climbed out and pretended he hadn't been hurt by the rough ride. Nah, all good, Dad. He spit the word dad out and Mo let it go, not wanting to cross Natalie who was eyeing their new trailer home. The boys got the family belongings transferred into the trailer while their parents sat at the little dining table, cracked open cans of cords and celebrated. Natalie talked excitedly about the mysteries of nature around them, how she could finally see the stars overhead and the boys could explore the woods. Uncle Bob came by a couple of days later to check on them and gave them each a silver dollar. Mo grabbed them all up as soon as he left. That white shoe bastard thinks he owns me now, said Mo as soon as his uncle was out of earshot. A yellow bus would pick the four older boys up and take them to a K-12 school on the edge of Huntsville. Their classmates were friendly and thought it was cool that the Rosedales were from California. Morris got a job as a welder and started to pay Uncle Bob back for the trailer. Brad got a job that paid a dollar an hour cleaning out some old warehouses on the weekends, which made him wheeze and cough. The boys would come in from the woods with ticks stuck on them and chiggers burrowed under their skin. Natalie tried to burn the ticks off with her cigarette, but parts stayed in the skin and they got infected. Morris was too tired to go out after work and would get drunk to treat his back pain. By the weekend, there was no food in the house and they would go to the store and stock up, but it would never last. Even with the drinking, Brad respected that his father was working hard and loaned him what was left of his savings to help with the high cost of feeding five growing boys. He never saw a dollar of it return. Mo came home from work late and then a few times not at all. It was a small town and the word got around. Uncle Bob's wife, Ginny, called and told Natalie that Mo had a girlfriend. That night they had a screaming fight. You lousy loser! You killed my boyfriend, and now you're out screwing some whore in town? Loser! Loser! Who do you think you are? She said it over and over until he hit her to make her shut up. But she kept talking, so he went out again and didn't come back. Natalie called her mother in Pasadena and two days later had money for six bus tickets back to L.A. Bradley would come home from working 10 hours on Saturdays and Sundays at the warehouse and stick his cash wages into a secret hole he had made in the wall of the trailer. He had a full-time job waiting at the Sonic Drive-In as soon as the school year let out. He also had a girlfriend, Barbara, who had befriended him the first week of school. Welcome to Texas. You sure are a cute one, Barbara said. My daddy just bought me a pickup truck. I'd love to take you for a ride and show you around town. The extroverted girl was pretty cute herself, and they spent enough time together over the months to grow some serious feelings for each other. The unexpected announcement came one Saturday evening after Brad had stashed his wages in the wall. Bradley, get your things packed. We're going back to California, said Natalie. What? How? Why? But he knew why. The real question was why had it taken this long? And why had she trusted coming to a place that smelled of cow manure, where it rained so hard you had to stop your car on the side of the road, and where there was a never-ending invasion of insects that tried to eat you alive? Don't give me a hard time, please. I need your help right now. I'm done with his lies and bullshit. Someone is coming tomorrow to pick us up to take us to the bus station. I'm sorry. It will be better back in California. I'll never let him bother us again. She was as earnest as he had ever heard her be. I haven't finished the school year. 
and I just got my grades back up to straight A's. I'm working and making new friends. He was thinking about his time with Barbara, who was in the running to become a valedictorian of her class. Their talk about graduating high school and going to college together, parking at the lake and kissing in her pickup truck. Natalie put her hands on her hips and threw her chest out. Oh, come on. You'll make A's in California and find another job, and you'll make new friends. Brad sat down to think it over. He owed her and his brothers that much. Maybe he should find a quiet place and meditate on it. His mother went for a cigarette. The revelation of what would happen suddenly struck him like a thunderbolt. If he went back to California with her, he might get caught up in the craziness and hurt someone or get hurt. He might become an alcoholic or drug addict. Imagining himself back in that hellhole with his father gone and his mother's new boyfriend coming around, the parties, the inevitable craziness, filled him with doom and dread. Mom, he said, I don't need you anymore. I don't need dad or grandma Mary or anybody in this crazy family. I'm staying here. I'll make my own life now. His mother begged and guilt tripped him. And finally, when she saw none of it was working, she asked for money. He gave her a hundred dollars and she left him alone. Natalie had a way of getting stuff done when her feet were put to a fire and Mo had burned her for the last time. The next day, he helped them into the old Lincoln town car that came up from town. When they were seated, their stuff filling the trunk, Brad went around and gave each of his brothers and his mother a hug or a kiss, then ran back to the trailer before they could see the tears dripping down his face. Then he turned to watch a cloud of dust settle after the car vanished behind some trees. He knew he had to get out before Dad returned. Finding his family gone except for the oldest son would make Brad a sitting duck for Moe's rage. He called Barbara and had a bag and a box of his stuff down at the road when she pulled up. Hop in, honey bunch, she said through the passenger's window of her Ford pickup. You got something there for me? He loved her Texas accent, but all he could think of was how she would react to his story. Just a minute, he said, putting the stuff in the bed of the truck. He ran around and jumped in, and she made a three-point turn to get back to the main highway. What's the hurry, darling? How've you been? Cat got your tongue? Brad was staring straight ahead. Barbara's extroverted personality complimented his quiet one. They had fun at some school socials where she would do all the talking. Now, he kept his eyes on the road ahead. I'll tell you as soon as we get to the highway, Barbara. Thank you for coming right away. There it was. Moe's green pickup truck coming straight towards them. Oh, he's in a hurry, said Barbara, slowing down to make room. Hey, isn't that your daddy's truck? Don't stop, said Brad, hunched down below the dashboard. Whatever you do, do not stop. Somebody's in trouble. Okay, you got it. Barbara crept along the shoulder of the road and waved as Mo passed through. Brad heard his father toot the horn and imagine he gave Barbara a nod and a wink. As soon as he finds an empty trailer, he's going to turn around and come after us. Brad sat up and looked back to see the dust follow the green pickup until it disappeared around a bend in the road. A cow mooed from a nearby pasture, and they passed a big farmhouse. There were only six homes in the three miles between the Rosedale trailer and the highway. Barbara focused on the road and bounced along until she could merge onto the highway. It was then that Brad started his story. He finished as they arrived at her house in a quaint neighborhood of Huntsville, where everybody had covered porches and rocking chairs, long gravel driveways, and lush green lawns. Poor darlings, she said. Your mama and little brothers all on a Greyhound bus and terrified, most likely. It hurts my head thinking about that. And what are you going to do? Your daddy's going to rip you a new one when he catches you, I bet. I'm trying to figure it out. I just know if I go back to L.A. with them, I'm going to wind up busted up or dead. There's nothing I can do to help them anymore. I've tried and I tried. She pulled into her driveway. Let's talk to my mama. Come on in, honey. Brad had met Barbara's parents at a school event. They were outgoing like her, and he barely got a word in. Their daughter liked him. He was polite, and he made good grades, so he was good enough for them. They sat at the kitchen table and drank sweet tea. Barbara told the story, Brad adding details where needed, and in no time, Barbara's mom was inviting Brad to stay with them. You can share a room with Barbara's younger brother. He won't bother you, she said. It was a blessing. Brad rode with Barbara to school every morning and took a job working at the Sonic, saving money for a car. Summer came, and he took on more work while Barbara got a part-time job in a legal clinic. Mo never caught up with Brad. He called Grandma Mary, and as soon as he learned that Natalie and the kids were on their way back to California, he moved his girlfriend into the trailer. Brad became part of Barbara's family, although rarely joined in on any of their activities. He worked or studied constantly, 
graduating a year early, which put him in the same class as Barbara. Everyone liked him. I've never seen a boy work so hard, said her father. Going from the trailer trash life of his family to Barbara's nurturing church-going family fascinated Brad. It inspired him to visit the public library where he would read for hours about abnormal psychology and try to figure everybody out. It also set him for his career choice. He would be a psychotherapist and help people fix their broken minds.